Brisbane, Australia. Um, I am not in the virtualization team, in case anyone wonders why they don't know who I am. Uh, I'm a member of our graphics uh, team. Uh, I decided three or four years ago I wanted to do this project. It's taken me this long to start because other things were more important. So, uh, this is my objective to do a virtual based 3D capable GPU so that for QB it's only to do this. I can get some operating systems that on hardware acceleration. So, um, first of all, this is I have to order this research project. Not a <laughs> plan for any product or anything. This is mainly just me. I've been given the time to work on this. Uh, I want to get it done, and I'll see if I can get it in the time I've been given. Uh, I'm hoping to, that will change, but at the moment, that's my disclaimer. Uh, the main focus have so far has been working on the 3D side of this, trying to figure out how to make a virtio 3D device work. Uh, and I've been trying to get familiar as much as possible with virtio and QMU code. Um, the idea is the, the 3D GPU I've designed is based on a thing we have in the Mesa project, which is the open source 3D graphics software project called Gallium 3D, which is a it's like this intermediate representation is what we call it, but it's basically the interface between um, the hardware specific code and the non specific code inside the Mesa that we use. Not all drivers use it, but it's been used for quite a lot of them. And it's sort of like a simplification of all the 3D stuff that's been done, like GL and DirectX, and it sort of takes a lot of the common pieces of those and makes it into a sort of just a standardized interface that we use. So far it's all been Linux focused. I have sort of looked at direct 3D in the past, but I haven't done anything yet. It's a big project to do a direct 3D driver for something like this. Um, so for in the area, there are some other projects that have looked at this before. So you may have heard of some of these different areas that have been done. So there was a vGallium project, which was done as a research project, I think, which then were involved. Um, it relied on Gallium drivers in the host, so that was a, sort of a non-starter for us. We didn't really want to have this. You must have a, a, a specific driver in the host side. Uh, it was based on a very old version of Gallium. It was totally unmaintained. It was one off. We did it. We searched. In terms of actually trying to use this for something base, it was considered not a great place to start from. And uh, people asked why VirtualBox did. They have got a as your baseline is quite a large stuff, and the security of it is unknown. There's a number of times pointed out that passing through the straight GL without actually going or cutting it down is going to cause you a lot of problems. Uh, VMware have their SPGA2 device. I think they now have a newer version of that that came out. Uh, it's open source. They have an open source driver for Linux for it, so you can see how the interface works, but you can't give any input to the design, so it doesn't help you. How can you? Make something better. These guys won't talk to us, and I have talked to them for a number of years, and they have not. They have no interest. It's also based on DirectX 9, which is old. They have one that's now based on DirectX 10, and possibly 11 coming out soon. And we have a project which a lot of guys here know about and work uh, inside and right out. And yeah, it, it was a 2D solution based around the Windows XP model. Uh, I was trying to think about how the 3D could work with that, but it was. I sort of decided it was going to be quite a complicated stuff to do anyway, without having that on top of my things to do. So I thought I'd look at doing it from scratch using Virtio. And I really wanted to use Virtio as a basis. So kind of buy some Virtio. This was going to be a nice step I want to take. So, what are the components of this project? How many pieces do I have to work on? So, this is just a quick diagram of where the functionality for this project lives. So, um, on the uh, the host side, inside the QMU, we have to have a Virtio GPU. So this is just a standard Virtio display device. It will have work on MMIO. The plan is to work on MMIO, PCI, VG, all those sort of things. And then a large chunk of rendering code. The job of the renderer is to take the connection from the get and use OpenGL on the host to render it. And have you use it for the display. So there are two chunks on the Get basically need to have a complete Linux graphics driver stack, which is a kind of 
driver, which is DRM KMS, uh, an XORG driver component, which is called a DDX, and a MESA component called a Gallium driver. So these three components live inside in the uh, host. We, we have those components for every graphics card. It's the same sort of system. They, the functionality sort of played up here, and KMS driver is responsible for initializing the hardware, setting modes, and managing memory. The XORG DDX is uh, meant for translating XORG rendering into command stream to send to the hardware, and the Gallium driver is meant for translating the Gallium interface into command streams to send to the hardware. Uh, so NASA then has a generic piece of functionality that will convert the guest OpenGL layer into Gallium first, so we don't need to look at that. Uh, in relation to how this would work on Windows, it's, I think it's surprisingly the same for Windows 7 and 8. I think Direct or Windows XP is a bit different in how it works, but Windows 7 and 8, they sort of have the or DDX component in those sort of three places. Um, there are also some code done in Mesa to allow us to reuse some of that functionality so we could actually, the Gallium driver would be actually useful in Windows if we had another layer to translate from DirectX to Gallium, which VMware has but haven't open sourced, but have looked at working on something similar. So they are the major pieces of it. So how does it look from the virtualization side? Uh, so, so I've started off with just a single VertIO ring, just one queue. Uh, it's responsible for, this is where 3D hardware gets complicated. And I, I will go into some detail on what 3D hardware works, but you basically need to have context. So the VertIO ring is responsible for context management. You need to be able to create, destroy, attach resources, destroy resources. Uh, the ability to attach and destroy resources in the context is for security reasons. You don't want one context enabled to just pull up, guess what the, the IDs of, context, of resources on another context are. Um, you've got 3D resources that you want to manage. So 2D resources are a subset of these. But 3D resources, like you want to be able to create, destroy, and uh, attach, scatter, gather, and detach, scatter, gather. Because when I first looked at this, I was using VertIO um, for every trans, ever, for every VertIO uh, that you put on the queue, queue entry, I was putting, attaching the objects to it that the number of FT entries in the objects were way bigger than Vertio was willing to deal with. I think we were hitting, at worst case, it was hitting like four or 5,000 for some small for a five meg object. But I sort of had to change my mind how to design that and went to it. Just having a specific thing saying, here are all the FT entries for this object, these two, and then use that from then on and invalidate them if there's a problem. We have DMA-like transfer functions. So this is just basically, I have a resource, I need to put something in it. I have a resource, I need to get something out of it. There's no direct access from the guest to a linear representation on the host side. Because the way OpenGL works, you never have that. And if you want to render using OpenGL at the, you know, the next stage, the side we just have no linear access between that. You will use transfer objects to DMA in and out of the objects that are on the host side. Um, so the submission of command streams. So this is all the sort of low-level management of the hardware. There's another chunk of functionality that it fills up command streams and sends those. That's the way standard 3D hardware works as well. Um, the virtual is also responsible for capabilities. So we want to be able to go, oh, my host has able to do GL4. So my guest could probably do GL4. Or my host has some other features that I haven't introduced yet. That's my guess. So, but I, I need a way to, here's a list of things my host can do. What does that mean for the guest? So that's all managed in this ring. Um, and then there's a thing called fencing. I know people are, it's another 3D rendering term. It's basically you put a, you send the whole of stuff to the hardware and you put a fence in. And then you send the whole of stuff there, you put a fence in. And then the hardware tells you what fences have gone. Uh, we use the exact, the similar model for this. It's just, you get an IRQ whenever a fence expires to say, well, everything before that point is dealt with. You're free to free the memory, you're free to use it. It sort of like notifies that you get up the virtual queues. Um, and then I have also a config space using the uh, QME config stuff, or the VertIO config space. I was use, I've been using that for reading back the fencing code. There's a 32 bit number of fences have. I just read that from the config space. I don't want to be doing a full queue operation to get those back. And cursor handling, you probably don't really want to queue up cursor handling so much. You generally just want to say, where's the cursor now? I want to know where it is now, I want to know where it is now. So you just, you want to tell it the hardware as much as possible. I put the cursor 
pay it off. You don't want to sort of queue up thousands of move the cursor, move the cursor, move the cursor, move the cursor. It's like you get way too much information. Um, so then the other piece of that is the command string, the piece above that. What, go, what goes into that? This is the actual 3D rendering code. So the Gallium driver in, that, in Mesa produces all of this command string, sends it to the kernel, and the kernel passes it through to the uh, host, and then the host renders. This is how complicated 3D is. There's a whole space of objects. These are Gallium state objects. If people are, are in any way um, familiar with how 3D rendering works, Blending, rasterization, PSA, depth stencil, alpha, there's shaders, there's samplers, there's queries. You need to be able to create these objects, find them, destroy them. Um, then we have some things that aren't in objects, setting up frame buffer state, scissors, viewport. Uh, and then we have rendering commands that just draw. So I'll give you all the face, draw with that state, clear the buffers, blitz, which is just move stuff around, like copy, and queries. So this is all, if you've never responded, looked at OpenGL interfaces or uh, direct 3D interfaces. These are all sort of objects that they use to produce. So I just generally take the Gallium interface and linearize it pretty much into a command stream and send that command stream across to the host and then the host unpacks that. So what does the host have when it gets it? So the host has a renderer. This is the big chunk functionality on the host. Quite a lot of code in here. This takes those Gallium command streams and put them back into OpenGL. Uh, it's, it seems like, you know, because generally inside the guest, it's taking GL and translating it to Gallium. You think, oh, let's hold it back to GL. That should be a rather simple operation. It doesn't always work out so well. There's a lot of corner cases and problems where GL does something inconsistent, or there's a lot of cases where OpenGL just simply won't let you go from OpenGL back to OpenGL. You, just, you get information and you have it you know, internally, and then OpenGL has no interface to put that back in from the top. It's quite annoying. So the renderer's main things to do are convert Gallium to GL, convert PGSI shader language to GLSL shader language. Um, for a while, I thought we had this concept of OpenGL context. For a while, I thought I could get away with using OpenGL context for all the rendering in the guest. This ran into a problem for certain, again, like in a case where OpenGL doesn't let you do something that it requires the hardware to do. So uh, I end up having to implement these whole context and guest context, which is turned out okay, but one of those problems. Um, and it works out the capability from the GL version of the drivers it's running on and sets those and sends them into the guest. Uh, if I don't have a problem with a reasonable GLSL 130 is what I'm using at the moment for writing the shader programs, it will probably have to go up if I have different things to render. Um, so what does it mean for what we're running in the guest? Currently in the guest, I'm exposing OpenGL 2.1 and GLSL 120. This gets me basic same functionality. It's probably hardware that's five years old, maybe six in some cases, maybe eight and other. So Intel hardware that's probably four or five years old. But hardware that's probably eight years old. Um, it's also where VMware is and where they've been sort of stuck for a long time. Um, the host requirements are GL21 and GLSL 130, which is probably still hardware that's about three, four years old. But I have done work to get GL3 in the host. It's working. I have worked it, but there's a couple of problems I hit with. Um, the certain thing, again, GL is interface where you go, oh, here's some data. No. And you're like, okay, but I want to hibernate. And you get the data back so I can give it to you later. No. So you've got some corner cases where you're going, oh, I need to figure out what's what done with my data or how to get, how ways I can get it back. Um, OpenGL 3.1 and above is really messy. I know people are, again, it's one of those, you have to know how OpenGL works, but they were going to change the standardization and remove all the compatibility stuff. And they kind of did that, but they kind of didn't. And they, add, they left the compatibility stuff in a special extension. The open source drivers don't expose this extension. I'm running, uh, if you want to be able to do 3.1, it has to be able to do all the older versions of GL as well. But that's running on a host that has 3.1. Let it do all the other work as well. So it's kind of, you have to start to do that. It gets much more the, the renderer may have to become a bit more complicated to deal with that. It may have to start emulating old features of OpenGL on the, on the new features of OpenGL. Which for GLEF and for ARM. So from the 
point of view of the fragment part of 3D integration with QMU and some issues I ran across. How do I get this probably just an answer these later I probably My first pass at this was the current code I've, I've got is a big mismatch of the cut and paste code from the virtual PCI code and my driver and a few other places. The size didn't work and the cut and paste hack and didn't contest the rest. Um, but how to get an IRQ on a virtual queue, IRQ in a virtual only device? I was not sure I can do this. Uh, I, maybe I can just use a second vert queue, so I, but I think that's going to be overkill for what I want. I don't know. I really need to just have a second vert queue for that. For config space pages, yeah, so this is slightly, I wanted to do it outside the config space interrupt because I wanted 64 bit values, <laughs> which it didn't do. So I, yeah, I've been looking and trying to figure out what's the, what's more else, probably one of those things I'll submit the code and someone go, oh, that's a really bad way to do that. You should do this, or there's no way, nice way to do this. Um, I make this, yeah, we, I, I've talked to a few people, and it's just one of those, oh, not really sure the best way to do that. Um, and again, GL 3.8, the context creation problem of deprecating how to render old OpenGL on top of new OpenGL is a big issue I have sort of pushed away and hope won't come back. So uh, I'll, I'll do a demo of this later. But this, that's pretty much the core of it work I've done on the sort of research project of 3D, how to get it working. It does work in the sense of I've got no shell running, I've got games running, I've got a few apps running. But it's on a very, very unstable base of code. I just hacked up to make something that I could demo, I could run on. But like, the, the, you would not want to see the QMU side of this. <laughs> so that sort of led me to a, I better do this properly. So I started another project do this like, differently. So it's the second project. I only started really working on it a few weeks ago properly. But I wanted and I think Andy, so you mentioned you were looking at doing this Vertio simple GPU before, so I was like, well maybe I should try and take over that. Um, so basically we want to do a project that just produces a basic Vertio GPU. That I can then attach my renderer to separately as a capability. So if it's not there, the guest doesn't see anything, but if it is there the same driver stack will work in the guest whether it's there or not. It will just fall back. Uh, it needs to be multi-head capable. None of the drivers currently in it really do multi-head. But it's a multi-head, but it's based at the spice level, not in the QMU level. It's uh, hidden above it all. Um, it needs to work on accelerators. It needs to work accelerated as well, but the basic idea is it needs to be on accelerators so we can just use it for just rendering X or no things or just the, the console. Um, and it needs to work for as a basic VertIO device for MMIO, VertIO, MMIO, PCI, and VGA. Uh, so I started looking into this a few uh, a few weeks ago. Um, one of the first things I came across was, oh, multi-head, how would I do that? Oh, SPL 1.2, oh, doesn't do multi-head. Doesn't do multi-window, SPL 1.2, so I thought I better start. So the side project, again, I got sidetracked. So I had to start porting QEMU to SPL 2. But a lot of reports of QMU in STL2, but it's badly done because I've done it in a separate file instead of doing it in STL.C. Um, so there's multiple ways to support AFGB search support. It's way better open GL support than STL2. It's EGL support, which I need for something. And it has a whole new way of doing input and event handling. So it's all, anyone's got to do STL input code and actually know how it works. Not so great. <laughs> But yeah, the input handling has really changed. And I, I, I don't mean, I, I lucky enough, I sit beside this guy who, who does all the input stuff, right? I know all the input stuff for Red Hat stuff. So he was like explaining to me the basics so I could go, oh, well, yeah, now I can figure it out. But that thing is sort of a side project. But I think I've got mostly done. I'll have to redo it. I think I'll redo it as an SDL2.c instead of if that SDL2.c as much as I've done. I think it would look a lot nicer. 
And then, of course, the QME console code is like top of the future. Uh, it doesn't deal with multi head either. The idea of using. I did this one way. But I have some problems doing it both. Uh, basically, yeah, you want to have multiple display surfaces per console. I did it, and then I did an index so you know which one you want to stop. I use the SEL multi window stuff to do a demo, which I'll show you. Uh, the main reason I ended up doing is the arrays of the space surfaces versus the other thing was with the active console objects. When I had multiple windows, I think it was getting confused over because it is only a single console. Even though I've got multiple windows on the screen, it should, in my mind, it was this is just one output. It's just got multiple heads on it, as opposed to it being a completely separate console for each of these objects. So if you had multiple cards, I think it made, it made sense to do it that way. But with multi head on one card, I think it made much more sort of sense. Again, we have to look into that. One of the issues was how to work out how many heads to expose. Do we do that through that command line, or do we do that through some other? It, it, it's a configuration problem. So some people are probably asking, why did I just get FDL? <laughs> There's so much other options I have inside of the CPU. Um, well, the problem with most of them is they all remote, like using spies or BMC or any of the current remoting things. Is, they all require reading back the stuff that's on the hardware. And for 3D rendering, that's really, really not a good idea. You do not want to be reading back every single frame from the graphics card and then drawing it on the screen because the well, graphics card already has this information. I want to draw it on the screen. So initially, that's why I did with SDL. We don't want to get some idea of how fast I could make this. And the only way to do that was to actually run it as OpenGL on top of SDL without doing a readback for every frame and sending it to myself. So um, that was one. That was the main reason it's currently only being done with SDL. I'm actually running SDL using Nibbert because I'm unable to use Nibbert. Uh, <laughs> so now I have a very hacked up configuration where Nibbert starts my my thing and it didn't launch it on my local display. And that's what it is. I looked at the GTK briefly. The original version of SDL I started working on was pre GTK, and the one I'm supporting to has it. So I, I made up a using GTKs. It has GL interfaces as well. So, um, but yeah, again, I'd like to do different things I want for, I'd like this to run this in, um, in Fedora, just using our standard part manager setup. The, where that runs into problems is, as you know, like, uh, Libvirt will talk to you in its own little sandbox. So I can't really access my display. And I not really want this access to display directly. But the only way to get OpenGL currently on both Linux systems is to access the X window display. You can't get OpenGL without being directly talking to the, the display. But going forward, we have um, the EGL, which is like a embedded GL subscriber, but it, it, it's sort of like a, a separate binary. You just run it. So you could actually have QMU running in the sandbox, in the graphics card, in the device nodes, and rendering the image. But then you have a problem with it. it's now it's rendered, it's in the graphics card. So we have work being done for way on other projects that sort of actually help there. Um, there's been a project called DRM Render Nodes, which has been to actually just allow that one process to access the graphics card without display, so that it doesn't interfere with your running X window display or your running system. Thank you. And then hand file descriptors back to the viewers on the local machine. And 
that is using Spice or VNC, it'll just read back the image and send that. Um, and then you will do the compositing. There is also an area where I haven't looked too far into yet is how do we do remoting on top of it. Uh, remoting was deliberately left out of my initial implementation because there's been a number of should we do it by remoting the rendering stream or should we do it by remoting the final video, whether we use codex. Um, it's been up in the air all times so far pointed to that remoting using the rendering stream is wrong. It will not work. There's the amount of data you have to transfer. People have often got feelings saying, oh, this is a should work. I, I believe it was. We talked to people from other companies who actually tried it, and you'll notice the MWR don't do this for a reason. So, <laughs> they say, don't do this. It's not, it may work. Obviously, you don't know when it's not going to work. The case is too big, so you could go, okay, it might just work for my desktop right now. Uh, I could launch one app and it will just stop working. It will be too much data and everything will be. You know, it will go from decent frame rate to no frame rate or infinite frame rate. The last bandwidth will be used. How do you do this with codex? Again, it's outside my area. I'm not a huge codex person. Seems to most of the people are using H.264. What they're doing, what I think the NVIDIA grid guys do is they render on the GPU and then H.264 encode on the GPU and then they back the, in, the encoded stream. So they're reading back less. And that's all you really care about is the ability to read back to the F and the GPU instead of pull back every frame and use the CPU to do it. Same with GPU encoding is a bit less. I suppose it's not as efficient as the GPU to encode it as it can be on the CPU. They don't care because they don't want to read it back. That's all they want to avoid is the reading back bit. Um, so yeah, that's sort of like the basics of where that would. We are looking into both of those codec and remote using streaming. Android guys have done it, but Streaming, the data also suffers from what happens with disconnect. That's fine if you're an Android game. You just start again, but if you're a desktop and you've just given the guy a whole lot of data and you disconnect and you see all of that. OpenGL suffers from not being pixel perfect. So if you do want to do a readback, which I do use, if you use GNOME Shell on your laptop, if you use the mouse, it reads back one pixel from the graph. Every mouse. Like every pixel of mouse will be what's underneath the mouse so it knows what to light up. Doing that over a network would be intolerably slow because well, it just would be because the latency would kill you. But to avoid doing that, you'd have to render it locally. And then you're like, well, I'm rendering it locally, I'm rendering it locally. And then you're like, well, I'm just different, use different images because the oh, gel's not picked perfect. And this guy's an NVIDIA card and this guy's got an AMD card. Am I going to get the same image? Are they going to be accurate? It sort of degrades as one of these, oh, this is going to get tough more and more as I go on. So it's sort of, yeah, there's a lot of problems with doing streaming and rendering that, yeah, it works. It's game, but when you want to actually produce something that's, I suppose, enterprise or you know, people have desktops running on this, they don't want the desktop to just go away when it disconnects. You're going to have to deal with these. So that's pretty much my talk. I have a couple of demos. I'm just hoping they will stick on the screen and I'll try to do a very, uh, I've got the, the 3D rendering demo is actually surprisingly not crashy. Uh, I'm just hoping it'll fit in the screen. Of course, now it doesn't start. Oh, yeah. So this is the VM booting up with Laura. I don't have a cursor at all because I had to turn it off. 
So the SDL2 has also ARGB cursor rendering, which SDL1.2 doesn't have. And I actually hacked it up for a demo that GL would render the cursor, but it gets quite unstable. The lines are not mine. But I've got to go inside the window. So I will do what everyone does with GNOME shells, just run the terminal. So yeah, this is all. This is running on top of the virtual GPU. You can see it's it's probably the slow because I think I'm overlogging, but it, it is all rendering correctly. It is all the same. It's all using the full stack. This is on my old code base, not on the new one. Um, but I'll also just do a. I've actually got. I've also gotten Wayland working on top of this and a few other. Gnome shell may not. I may have been asking too much. Oh, yeah. I'm happy to don't tell it. Not happy. Because I haven't implemented some of the optimizations we need to do to full screen render. But I like. So again, the arena runs. Renderable. It's actually playable if the mouse would work properly, but it has some issues with that. But, uh, it's actually a bit slower. Than, it's actually getting sinker to my frame rate. But um, I have it done in, I think, natively on, on my desktop in the office. Open Arena was getting 630 frames a second. And inside the VM, I was able to get like 350. And VMware was getting around the same. So like, it's been close enough to what they've been producing. And um, I actually have some ideas for making it even slightly faster. I think there's just overheads in that when it's running natively, you don't have as many copies. When it's running inside the VM, you have to copy from one place to the next. So it's sort of like, oh, just back up anyway. So yeah, that's the, the good demo. This is the, I'm not sure it's going work demo. Actually, I don't think I have enough screen space to show this anymore. I've gotten used to having a very high resolution laptop. All right. Really slow. But uh, if anyone has any questions, probably should ask them now and I can answer them while I'm attempting to get this to not fail. Yeah, I walked on here. Yeah, well, I was hoping that it sounds like at the end, it, first of all, it's upstream SDL2 ports, get that in, um, then look at porting, getting the current IO GPU space line in. I would say the SDL2 port is probably only, I could do that in a couple of weeks. It's just moving it without SDL2, let's see. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure if you can hear me.
Yeah, I think that makes sense. It's just to, to make sure that we keep the graphics of as much the command stream out of the the specs and have that maintained in Mesa project. Currently, the way the code is based, the render is written inside of Mesa. So I've got it all based inside of Mesa, and it produces a library that then I have QDB loads. And the interface between them is four or five functions. It's not huge. Uh, the biggest problem I have is I need to do it. Currently, I've got a GL, a thread running all the OpenGL versions. So OpenGL and getting stuff into that thread and out of it is a bit messy. So I think that's going to be one thing. The first implementation of the Vertical GPU, I wasn't going to use GL as a renderer. I was just going to use the current code and then you know, figure out how to use GL with SDL as a renderer and then work on the next level on top. It's going to be like a building up thing. So yeah, this is going to stay on the screen, of course. Um, there is, it should be gone. A second window, but I don't know where it is. Maybe it didn't. Unfortunately, not. Gallium, I'm sorry, it's the Gallium serialization format stable. Uh, Gallium is not a stable API. It's an external implementation detail of Mesa. Um, my current plan is to either fix on a version of Gallium and fork the pieces I, I, I'm using, uh, and then just when they add features, add those features and capability extras. Um, but there's also pieces like the shaders that are written in text format, and I'm going to try and get those at least versions on those shaders, so I can say oh, I only support the shaders of the version 4, don't give me a version 5 shader, and that the rest will take care of it. It just won't expose new features that need the version 5 shader. So I, I've been discussing those in the Mesa project a bit. Trying to get, uh, I, I think this is it's probably why it's going to work. But yeah, basically this is running two, one QMU with two windows. So that, um, and using SDL2. I also say I haven't tested um, or even looked at doing this with ARM or any of the other architectures, ending this well off my head. In my head. So yeah, if someone was interested in looking at the ending this type of things on it, yeah, this problem just will the system not working. Dash zero at the top means zero window. There should be a dash one. Because I'm creating two windows of the same size. Yeah, I didn't do anything that time. So yeah, we'll leave that demo. But yeah, basically all it was is just a simple vert IO GPU using two windows. It just it just shows you two frame buffer consoles and X window start and, and crashes. So, yeah, I don't want to ask anything else. Find me around. <laughs>